All right, guys, today uh, I'm going to talk about the Chapter 8 performance-based assessment and then Chapter 9 performance-based assessment as well. Uh, so that's going to conclude everything that I need on the final for performance-based assessments. And then all that's left is just to go through that checklist of what I posted under the final and just make sure that you've answered kind of the extension questions. So kind of things like, uh, what did you learn from it? What would you have done differently? Definitively saying, hey, this is what happened. This is what I can say. This is how I modified it. Stuff like that. Uh, okay, so with the Chapter 8 performance-based assessment, there were four questions to it. The first and the fourth are definitely the most complicated. And the second and the third, uh, the second one you should already have done, but we'll walk through it again. And the third one is a 50-50 shot, uh, but most people are going to have the same answer. So the first part, uh, you had to develop a confidence interval where you think your population mean is found. Now you've done something a hundred times. So you have a sample mean, you know, on average, how long it would take you to do something when you did it a hundred times, or you know your average score based off the hundred times you've done something, things like that. Uh, so the context that I'm going to go over this with, it's going to be my example of going for a walk and it takes me on average 10 minutes, give or take two minutes. So the standard deviation of two minutes. And so to create a confidence interval, the objective that I'm trying to achieve is I am trying to say that with a certain level of confidence, that whenever I go on this walk that I have scheduled, that I have planned out, it will take me between blank and blank minutes. That's the entirety of the first part. So in order to do that, I'm going to need a point estimate, which is going to be my sample mean. And I need a margin of error. The margin of error is a value that I'm going to subtract from the mean and add it to the mean. And as a result, when I subtract, I get a lower bound. When I add it, I get an upper bound. And those two values are going to be the in-between with a certain level of confidence. We have a formula to find the margin of error. It's Z sub C times sigma divided by the square root of N. Now in all these problems, all these performance-based assessments, if we had a level of confidence, I've been keeping it at 95% for consistency. Now the number of deviations that corresponds with 95% is 1.96 deviations above the mean. So every single time that we use Z sub C, we're gonna be using the value 1.96. Now the sigma is going to be found from your data and then the sample size is going to be 100. To find the lower value of my confidence interval, I'm gonna take that point estimate, your sample mean, and subtract the margin of error from it. And then the upper value, the sample mean, which is your point estimate, plus the margin of error. So here's an example that applies the numbers. So as I said in the chapter six performance-based assessment, my average time it takes me to do a certain walk takes me 10 minutes with a standard deviation of two minutes. So I plug those numbers into my equation and I'm gonna be 95% confident, so 1.96 times my standard deviation of two divided by the square root of 100, which is 10, so 1.96 times 0.2 is about 0.392. So that means that my margin of error is going to be the 392 thousandths. So I'm gonna subtract 392 thousandths from 10. I'm going to add it to 10 and I get this range right here. So the statement that I can make, and this is the most important part of problem number one, is saying that we are 95% confident they'll take me between 9.608 minutes and 10.392 minutes to do this walk every time. I'm 95% confident that that's how long it will take me on average. Number two, we had done it as an assignment, but just in case you didn't do it, doing it once is going to count twice, technically three times when we include it on the final. Uh, to find the sample size, the idea behind this is that I gave you a certain uh, target margin of error. That was to be within 10% of your sample mean. I'm sorry, of your population mean, given you know your sample mean. Uh, so if I know my sample mean, I can figure out how many times I should go on a walk. And then once I find the average of those walks, 
I know with a certain level of confidence that I'll be within 10% of my population mean. Now, depending on your data and how volatile it may be, if your data is very spread out, then you're gonna to have to do a lot of samples. It's possible that the number of samples could be in the hundreds or in the thousands. Now, if your data is really close and really conservative, then you may only need a handful of sample sizes. So for this, since my average was 10 with a deviation of two, since my deviation is so small, that means it's not very spread out. So I'm not gonna need that many samples to be 95% confident that my sample mean is within 10% of my population mean. And so first Z sub C is 1.96. My sigma is going to be two, because that's what I got from my data. And the margin of error in the problem says to be 10% of your point estimate. So 10% of your sample mean. Well, my sample mean was 10, so 10% 10 of 10 is one. So I plug those values in, make sure you square it after you divide, and I get about 15.37. So what this translates to is I would need to go on about 16 walks, record those times, find the average, and that average, I'm 95% confident that I'm within 10% of my population mean. So the time that I get is going to be within 10% of whatever time it would take me every time. The third question is stating whether something is independent or dependent. Now, most of you have done something that's independent. Independent meaning that it's completely separate from each other. So whether it's you doing one thing then doing another and comparing, or it's you doing something and someone else doing something and then comparing, those are independent because one did not affect the other. Dependent is almost like a before and after. You get tested for certain levels of anxiety, then you go through counseling, and then you do the same activities again, are your levels of anxiety lower? Maybe you're doing a lifting thing and you've lifted a certain amount of weights. You figured out how many reps you could do with benching. Then you work out for a few weeks and then you test your benching again. Were you able to bench more after doing your exercises or was it less? So if you do something in between your two events to better or to worse yourself, be like, all right, was there a benefit? That's dependent. If they're just two existing things, that's independent. Now the fourth one, which is probably the hardest one of the four because it takes a little bit more work we wanna find our difference of means. And what we're trying to say is which of the two populations is higher or is better. Now, in order to do this, we first have to find the difference of our two means. So I created a second set of data and my first set said that it took me on average 10 minutes, give or take two minutes. Then I decided to put in some headphones and I did the same walk. Now it took me on average eight minutes, give or take three. So now I was walking faster on average. It took me less time to do my walk, but my data was a little bit more spread out. Now, what I wanna know is that, am I walking faster with music or without music? Or rather, am I walking slower with music or without music? Kind of the same thing but it's in context to how the problem is being processed. Now, if I think about which one is better or which one's higher, in this case, a higher value would mean a slower time. So when I assess my information, the better, what will be in quotations, but the better quality is going to be the slower of the two times. So if the first population dominates the second one, that means that the values of the first population were so high that even with the margin of error, I can still say that the first population took me more time. Now, if the second population dominates the first one, then that means I can say with a certain level of confidence that with music, it took me more time. Thus, I walk slower with music. So that's how we're going to break down number four. Now it's gonna be the same idea with the margin of error. I have to find the difference of means, that's my point estimate. I have to find the margin of error and that's what I'm gonna subtract and add 
to the difference of means. The Z score is still 1.96. I'm still 95% confident. S sub one is a sample standard deviation of my first data set. N sub one is going to be the same as N sub two, which is 100, because we took 100 data points from each. And the sample standard deviation sub two is going to be the standard deviation when I was listening to music. And I'm gonna plug those values in. And so when I plug them in, uh, 1.96 goes where the Z score is, two goes where the S sub one goes, 100 went sample sizes and three went for my S sub two. Simplify it out, keep on going, take the square root and I get about 0 0.7056. So now to find my range. Now my lower bound of my range is going to take my point estimate, which was taking 10 minus eight. So the first sample size minus the second and I get two. Two, take away that margin of error is 1.2944. Two plus my margin of error is 2.7056. So I'm getting this interval of 1.2944 to 2.7056. Well, let's break down what that means. So when I evaluate this, the difference of mean is positive, meaning I got a positive two. So what that translates to is that if I have a positive difference, then the first number had to have been higher. So I'm already thinking that without music, I walk slower, it takes me a longer time. Now, what will change that conclusion is if my margin of error is large enough to take my difference and move it to the negatives with my lower bound, but then keep it in the positives for my upper bound. Now, if that were to happen, I would have a different conclusion than the first one being higher. And if it was negative to negative, that would be a different conclusion as well. So let's break down the three different conclusions. Conclusion number one, when I do the lower and upper bounds, I have a positive number to a positive number. So it's a positive to positive interval, like what I have here. Now, if the interval is positive to positive, regardless of the actual value of the numbers, just the fact that they are both positive, that means that when I found the difference and subtracted the mean and added, or the margin of error and added the margin of error, I still had a positive interval. So with a 95% level of confidence, I can say that when I do not listen to music, it takes me longer to do my walk or I walk slower, something like that. Now, if I so happen to have a negative to negative interval, so let's say that it actually took me longer, let's say 12 minutes to listen to music and walk. So my difference in means would have been a negative two. Then when I subtract the margin of error and add the margin of error, I still have a negative to a negative interval. Again, I don't care about the numbers, it's just the fact that it's negative to negative. Now, if it were to be negative to negative, that means that the second population had to have had higher values. So I can say with a 95% level of confidence, that I walk slower when I listen to music. Now, the third and the final conclusion that could be made is that neither is better. So I don't walk faster or slower while listening or not listening to music. Now, if it were to be negative to positive, meaning the difference in means is so close that when I subtract the margin of error, it brings it to the negatives, and when I add the margin of error, it brings it to the positives, I'd be able to say with a 95% level of confidence, that listening to music or not listening to music does not affect my walking speed. And so the conclusion that I can make since it went from positive to positive, positive 1.2944 to positive 2.7056, I am 95% confident that walking without music is slower. So that's the entirety of the number four. Now for the chapter nine performance-based assessment, you only had one question and you need to use Google Sheets for this because we're gonna be using the t-test. Unfortunately, the way to do this without using Google Sheets would have been using a table, acknowledging the degrees of freedom and a few other things that would have complicated this process, but we were just doing it with Google Sheets. Now the idea with chapter nine is that we have a level of significance. So if I'm 95% confident that I know the answer, that means that there's a 5% chance that I'm, I'm wrong. 
Now, our level of significance is that percent that we think we might be wrong. The idea behind our chapter nine statistical test is that we are given a certain probability where it's okay to be wrong. And if we exceed that probability, then we cannot make some alternate conclusion. We just stick with what we know because there's too high of a risk of being wrong. Now, if the probability of being wrong is lower than what we're allowed or we're allotted, then it's okay to reject what we know to be true and then start to think, well, maybe something else is going on. And so what I'm asking everyone to do with a level of significance of 5% is to conclude whether or not there is a difference between the two. And so everyone's gonna do equals T test. And then hopefully you have your two data sets in one Google Sheet. You're gonna highlight the column of the first data set comma, highlight the column of the second data set, and then everyone is gonna do comma two, comma one. The reason why everyone's doing comma two, comma one is that since I'm just asking if there is a difference, that means it could be less than, it could be greater than. So there's two options, hence the two. If I wanted just less than or just greater than, then you'd put a one there. The last number is, uh, a Google Sheet saying there's three options. The other two options are dealing with with or without variance. We didn't work with variance in this class. It wasn't part of our understandable statistics curriculum. Uh, so we're just defaulting to one since that's the information that we were given. And then to make your statement, we're gonna type it in and what you get back is called a p-value. That p-value is the probability of being wrong. It's a type one error, by the way, but we won't get into that. If your p-value is more than 5%, then you cannot reject your null hypothesis. And you cannot say that listening to music makes a difference because we're going in there assuming that there is no difference and we're thinking there might be a difference. If our p-value is too high, then we cannot reject our null hypothesis. We cannot reject what we think is already happening. And what we think is already happening is that there is no difference. We have a hunch that something else might be going on. Now, if your p-value is below 5%, then we can reject the null hypothesis, which means we can reject the idea that listening to music while walking or not uh, makes a difference. Sorry, I just remember that the idea that listening to music not listen, uh, does not make a difference. Sorry, does not make a difference. So it does not make a difference. Uh, so anyway, so either you can reject the null hypothesis and go with the alternate, and that's if the p-value is below, or you cannot reject the null hypothesis when the probability of being wrong is too high. Hopefully that works. If you need any help, you know where to find me.